gives me great pleasure to welcome everybody to the second lecture in this year's Art Brown Bay series. And we are delighted to have uh, our own Ruth Trinum, who is giving a talk that I noticed the PowerPoint point has the alternative title, Prowessing the Past, considering the audience, which Ruth herself kindly noted would probably not get us the people from campus if we put it on the poster. So what did you put on the I think visualize it, visualization of the anthropology oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. something yeah. dull. But um, but Ruth is never dull. And I am absolutely looking forward to hearing about the project. Thank you. I will. Thank you. that you all have just heard because of its musical intricacy and we have fun performing it but it has the reputation of being very hard or difficult to listen to as perhaps you would agree from that excerpt if you were in fact listening the subtext behind this talk is that we get more enjoyment i.e. more joy in creating something than in consuming or watching or using the product of someone else's creativity you might disagree with me and be offended or write off, but bear with me just a little. This rule is bent a little when we remediate an original creation, that is, create something new out of an existing creation, as in performing a piece of music or play or playing a game. The rule is cracked entirely when we consume a good book or article or attend a sports event or a musical event or watch a good film. So how is it that some music and some books and films and events can evoke such an emotional outpouring by their audiences that we weep and will read, watch, listen, visit again and again? Can we find that heightened outpouring in experiencing 3D models and virtual reality about archeology span and cultural heritage? That's the question we're going to think about today. I'm focusing here on what has been called the rock star aspect of archaeology, 3D visualizations and modeling. It supposedly has such high entertainment value that it has been adopted in hundreds of museums, if they can afford it, worldwide. This is my focus because the original of this presentation was given in April at the UCSC conference on modeling the past 3D archaeology and the future of the past. There is no doubt that it is fun to create the 3D models, getting the accuracy right, creating the illusion of reality, creating visualizations of landscapes, the GIS maps, and the snazzy websites. I have never created a 3D model or a GIS map, but I have had great fun creating other kinds of visual presentations of archaeological research. And I, like many other people, have been not only a creator of visualizations, but also a user, audience member, consumer of other people's creations, as well as my own. In this presentation, I'm bringing the focus onto the users of the many examples of technological prowess that are on the web, the, clou <coughs> the cloud, and museum installations. Who are the actual users and audience of their different kinds of created products? What are their expectations and preconceptions? How do they use the different products? And how will they be changed by them and inspired towards their own creativity? And what are the intentions and aims of the creators? Who are the intended and expected audience and users of the products of their prowess? Are the actual users the same as the expected users of the products? And do the evaluations of use and visits, especially reuse and revisit, 
actually mesh with these intentions and expectations? And if not, does it matter? And if it does, what can we do to change that? At the UCSC conference, I asked rhetorically only the model creators, that is the creators of models, sorry, <laughs> as a user, do you have so much fun with your own or others' ma models that you want to keep coming back to, the, to visit or play time and again? Do you revisit the virtual places you have created? I'm not going to ask you a lot here because I'm not sure how many of you do this thing, this stuff. But those of you who do, just have a think about that while I'm talking. So what am I talking about? The Seville principles that you see here in the middle of virtual archaeology were created in 2011 and usefully categorized the different kinds of 3D applications with increasing distance from the empirical source of information. Virtual archaeology itself is the scientific, it's this kind of umbrella scientific discipline that seeks to research and develop ways of using computer-based visualization for the comprehensive management of archaeological heritage. Archaeological heritage is the tangible or are the tangible assets that comprise the source of knowledge on the history of humankind and that are studied using archaeological methodology. And comprehensive management is paperless or paper full documentation, preservation, presentation, access and public use of the material remains of the past. Virtual restoration is using a virtual model to reorder and reconstitute available material remains in order to visually recreate something that existed in the past. Virtual anastylosis, which I love that, I love that word, but it doesn't mean much more than virtual restoration, except the parts are dismembered and dis dispersed and so have, are more difficult to re reconstruct or to restore, I should say. Virtual reconstruction is a virtual model that visually recovers a building or object made by humans at a given moment in the past from their physical e evidence along with scientifically reasonable comparative inferences carried out by archaeologists and other experts. Virtual recreation, as we see, that virtual recreation, as we see here in the game of Fort Ross, goes a little further beyond the empirical data, and a, a virtual model is uh, that it is a virtual model that visually recovers an archaeological site, site, not just the buildings, it includes the buildings and the movable and immovable heritage of the material culture, but it also in, includes the environment, the landscape, customs, and general cultural significance, as in a computer game, as Fort Ross. So in order to understand the differing intentions and audience expectations of these different formats, defined by the Seville principles, I look in a slightly different way at the same thing. I make a distinction between, on the one hand, documentation and documentation here, the data, media, GIS, etc., that is the result of fieldwork and lab work, and that involves constructing both surrogates and representations of reality, the same as the first three categories of the civil, um, the civil principles. And on the other hand, what I like to call the afterlives of here, the afterlives of documentation work, mostly involving visualizations in various formats that are representations and not surrogates. That is, you cannot work with them in any way except as representations. In considering documentation in the field and lab, I make a distinction between the documenters' assumptions in their interpretations and their aims as the basis of their intentions. Their, interpreta their interpretations are based here that the media and data are surrogates for or precise or accurate representations of objective reality. And on this basis, their intentions are that media and data should be archived for the long term and should preserve and even replace the physical record of cultural heritage, both tangible and intangible, and should be accessible and shareable, and should be added as empirical support for visualization models. 
I make the same distinction for the creators of visualization or afterlives between the assumptions be behind their interpretations and the aims behind their intentions. Alice Waterson, who you'll be hearing a little more about in, uh, in 2012, has characterized archaeological visualization as a complex area of research which exists at the convergence of evidence, interpretation, scientific de uh, data collection, and storytelling. Visualizing the whole from fragments found by archaeologists is challenging because it involves the interpretation of what is missing, and that involves ambiguity and moving away from the prized authenticity, which is fine as long as it is made transparent. That being said, many creators of afterlives interpret their visualizations as truthfully and unambiguously representing real-world, authentic, original objects, sites, and events. Their intentions and expectations are that their visualizations visual, precisely visualize, visually reconstitute, simulate, and reconstruct buildings and sites. They enable immersive experience of living and moving in the past. They enable the interaction whereby users actively engage with the experience. And many projects are not planned or archived for the long term. They're not interested in longevity. There are other forms of diversity of creators than the ones I've listed here, according to worldview, their experience, archaeology, archaeological epistemology, and digital literacy. These, the, um, and di here, archaeological epistemology is an especially interesting background to the diversity of the crea creators. I've adapted here an interesting chart from Laia Pujol-Tost's recent presentation at the University of York showing how archaeological epistemology affects different aspects of the diversity of intentions and design of 3D applications and visualizations. I'm not going to go into the details. There are all sorts of cautionary tales about this chart, uh, but if we have time, which we probably won't, I'll come back to this. You can discuss it in Anthro 229A. It's perfect for that. <laughs> Turning to the audience, the users and the visitors, their experiences are also very diverse, and I've attempted in this simplified chart to make sense of this diversity by making a distinction between those that the grey ones here that involve using and rarely reusing digital documentation and information, mostly online via the internet and cloud-based services. And then those down here, the navy blue, that involve visiting or watching 3D installations, either by physical visitation or by sitting in front of a computer or mobile device. These tend to be relatively passive experiences for the user. That's in contrast to down here, which are the action uh, active experiences that involve active participation by the user, either by a physical experience such as reenactment or digitally, a simulated action in a video game, for example. And then finally, the mixed ones that are partly active and partly not are those that involve both um, m especially mobile devices such as social media, uh, games, alternate reality games, augmented reality, and so on. The audience of 3D visualizations and virtual applications themselves are diverse, ranging from consumers, users, <coughs> children, visitors, to professionals from archaeology and cultural heritage and museums. They are diverse according to their pre-knowledge, their digital and media literacy levels, their experience, education, and the opportunities they've had to, to in life, really, and their imagination, their thirst for knowledge, their empathy and, empathy, and especially their critical awareness. So Waterson has noted that however diverse they, there is still a pervasive expectation that a virtual visualization will present an unambiguous truth about the past and enable the user to experience the past in an accessible way with scientific accuracy. Both creators and audiences expect that 3D models and computer-generated genera visualizations will help to disseminate knowledge about cultural heritage sites and what the past was like and raise public awareness <coughs> 
of the need for preservation of cultural heritage and archaeological sites. The audience of 3D visualize oh sorry, got this. Systematic evaluations of the extent to which these expectations of virtual archaeology and heritage have been met have been based largely on the response, responses of museum visitors and more rarely heritage sites to in-place virtual reality installations. Rarely if ever are questions posed about revisiting an installation and almost never about access, reuse and recontextualization of heritage content or archaeological content. Three significant international standards for digital cultural heritage have been established in the last 10 years and have really raised the standard of 3D visualizations. Uh, they were all in response to both recommendations by both creators and users. In 2006, the, Lon the London Charter for Computer-Based Visualization of Cultural Heritage was conceived as a means of, and I quote, ensuring the methodological rigor of computer-based visualization, essentially promoting a framework of intellectual transparency supported by paradata that document the intellectual process behind the creation of the visualization. Then came the ICOMOS Iname Charter in 2008 that broadened the London Charter with inclusiveness of non-expert stakeholders and multiple interpretations and a focus on intangible heritage, storytelling and communities. And you can see here the, the critical theorists and um, are come beginning to show their metal here. But that, uh, then the principles of Seville brought it back to an academic basis and established a need for an academic theoretical de debate on the practice of vir virtual archaeology and virtual, virtual heritage, in which to implement both the London and Iname charters. Evaluators of virtual heritage and 3D installations in museums note that the viewers are still mostly passive observers and recipients of information. It's a, peri a perennial question for educators, as well as museum and cultural heritage professionals. How can we get users to participate more actively and make it their own? That is, turn information into knowledge. At the bottom of this slide here are, are just some um, phrases that I've collected from both evaluators and evaluees of recommendations for virtual archaeology and virtual heritage that I'm going to follow up in the rest of this presentation. These are some of the focus words I've garnered from the reading and reading the critical and evaluation accounts of 3D applications and visualizations. Some of the authors of those accounts are listed here with others in a bibliography at the end of a PDF version of the original publication. Returning to my question at the beginning of this presentation, what is it that engages or might engage users in the virtual reality model or other digital visualization project, products? What in a virtual re reality installation might evoke an emotional response of the kind that's evoked by a good book or a film or music? Why do we frequently revisit an amusement park or the zoo, but very rarely a virtual reality installation? What is it that might motivate revisitation and reuse of in-place and online installations? This is important because actually without it, we don't see any, any future or long-term um, preservation or sustainability of these models. I'll consider in the next part of this presentation what are some of the most important factors, most of which have popped up on this Wordle, which I was very proud to create, my first Wordle. Actually, my second. This next part of the presentation has been very hard to organize, and in taking the many recommendations and principles for installations and models that involve 3D visualizations of the past, I've tried to isolate certain major aspects that would certainly, for me, lead to greater engagement, including revisits and reuse. But no sooner do I isolate them than I realize they are all in interconnected. I've tried to express this here, and it's no accident, of course, that it kind of resembles or reminds you of the Olympic Games. It is that year, isn't it? <laughs> These are tangled aspects of making virtual reality more, meaning, uh, more meaningful to diverse audiences and academic fields. 
For the rest of this presentation, I'm going to focus mostly on exploring each of these circles in greater depth. As I approach each specific focus, you will see a number of even more specific foci. Please don't be disappointed if I don't address each of these. We would never get through half of this presentation if I attempted to do that. They're guides for my own future creative process, or yours if you like. Angela Labrador and Elizabeth Chilton in 2009 remarked with reference to digital heritage databases, but they might as well have been talking about visualizations, and I quote, they do little to engage end users in the interpretive process. In doing so, they limit authority and access for non-expert users. They presume a single knowable community or heritage audience. They presume a single consensual interpretation of content. Eric Champion suggested that optimally a user engages with virtual cultural environments as an an interactive process of observation, instruction, and active participation. I end quote there. This remark is true of an engagement with any kind of cultural environment, including that of the world of archaeological interpretation. Here at Chatelhuyuk, for example, you can see three degrees of active participation in the archaeological process. Up here is doing it, and then in the middle is doing it vicariously as you watch someone else doing it. And then down here is the archaeological site with no people, nobody working, and it's empty of any, devoid of any stories or life, save for those on the signage. All of the published evaluation studies point to the need for active participation through the incorporation of social networking and communities of practice into museum and heritage pro projects. Interestingly, mixed reality formats such as augmented reality using mobile devices have an enormous advantage in this respect in that input as well as output is in the hands as well as the eyes and ears of the visitor, as I'll show you later in, in the, for example, in the chess project. In spite of the criticisms that have been addressed about 3D visualizations and the creator's use of phrases such as this is the artist's impression and what the site might have looked like in the past, still there is something enchanting and seductive about them that entices viewers to think, perhaps through a message that is transmitted subliminally to the audience, and it's purely my own theory, that the model authentically reconstructs and reconstitutes the original from its remains. Thus the ambiguity of interpretation, the fact that many models could be constructed from the same remains is not grasped by viewers or is hidden from them. Either way, they are not given the opportunity to participate in the interpretive process. Exploration is at the heart of what a visitor to a virtual reality world does, and the continuing challenge for a museum designer as well as virtual reality modeler is how to make exploration interesting and meaningful. Tim Ingold in, his, in 2007 made a distinction between transporting oneself from point to point where the destinations are the main point of travel and wayfaring with no destination but with an endless unfolding of a path as you move where the process of movement itself is the main point of travel. Exploration in a virtual world can be carried out in either of these modes. The creator has the ability to enable, encourage, or restrict exploration through their design. Movement may be structured around a series of fixed, intended destinations, perhaps with information provided at each. But what do we look at as we fly, or race, or if you're lucky, walk, navigating from point to point? Usually, not a lot except looking for the next destination. The alternative is to design a virtual environment as a labyrinth in which the aim is not to reach the destination, i.e. its exit, but to enjoy walking and wayfaring along its many paths that are enhanced by meaningful interaction, provided by interesting features, dead ends, mysterious doors, surprising discoveries, an unfamiliar sight, or a movement in the corner that your eye will light on, or a story snippet that resonates or reminds you of a past experience. You can see where I'm favoring here, I know. 
I have an agenda. It is questionable what meaningful interaction can be provided by the soul-sickening fly-through fly -through, uh, pace much favored in the past by virtual reality modelers, and still is as evidenced by this recent upper uh, reconstruction of Pompeii. It was certainly meaningful to the creator, but digital media can now express movement of the first person through space at a human, wandering, exploratory pace. The lower example on the slide is a virtual reality exploration of the Roman Forum from on, on plan and model, which provides a slower pace, guided, albeit dehumanized, navigation. So why is such a pace still so rare? Is the expectation that the audience will lose interest if exploration takes too long? The CHESS project, and that's a marvelous acronym, you know the Europeans love acronyms, cultural heritage experience through socio-personal interactions and storytelling. That makes <laughs> chess. But it has a very interesting standpoint on all of the factors leading to engagement of visitors to museums and heritage sites. I introduce it here under meaningful exploration since the professed aim of the project is to stimulate and engage visitors while they explore museums and sites. One of its test sites in the, is the archaeological heritage and heritage site of Chatel Huyuk in Turkey. And the project was there in, from 2011 to 2014, where we had, uh, I personally and with Steve Mills and Michael Ashley, had several years before, in 2004 to 2007, given birth to the Remediated Places project. Our project, as in Ingold's Labyrinth, encouraged visitors to use their imaginations as they walked on the paths around the site, making these the focus of their attention rather than the traditional destinations of excavation areas, which is the focus of the CHESS project, the excavation areas. While the Remediated Places project was designed for devices that the technology of that time could not possibly support, the CHESS project takes advantage of all of the mobile communication technology available now, including augmented reality. Through the CHESS project, visitors receive a combination of rich media cues, clues and stories in branching narratives. I don't know if you can see it here. This, um, here you've got these are different stories and here is a branching one going to two other branches. And the visitors um, are provided with these on an iPad. They are encouraged to visit in pairs or small groups. And you can see here this small group has two, uh, each has a different iPad, each has, is following the same story, um, the same object, but they've each got different, story, uh, different actual focuses, stories, and different um, information. <coughs> so the aim is to facilitate discussion and critical reflexivity amongst group members about the content and interpretations that occur on different iPads in, in the group. And as they, as they together observe, the physical remains as the site emerges during their tour. It's a very interesting project. Since the beginning of virtual reality, the delight for audience, the delight for audience and aim of creators was to be able to create an authentic, immersive experience, the feeling of being present in the virtual environment. Thus, to create presence, which is defined as the perceptual illusion of immediacy in which the user acts in a mediated environment as if the mediation was not there. So you're completely immersed. With the new millennium, the aim for creators of virtual reality representations of archaeological and heritage places was to expand presence into cultural or social presence, so that the illusion of presence in a building was developed into an illusion of presence in a designed cultural and social context. In other words, the virtual space or environment became a virtual place or a virtual world. For the creator, the situation is complex since each person experiences cultural presence differently depending on their own personal history and cultural experience. Laya Pujol-Tost pointed out that what is important 
for a visitor is not how real the world is, but how you interact with the world and, as creator, how you enhance your user's world with affordances. This is an important point in terms of evaluating the different engagement of the audience in cultural environments along the continuum of mixed reality. Several authors, including Stuart Eve in 2012 and Laya Pujol in 2016, have recently suggested that the total immersion of users in virtual reality, as you see here in this particular game, or in many uh, in virtual reality, um, virtual reality worlds, which one enters to the exclusion of p physical reality, might be less engaging than mixed reality environments using augmented reality and aug augmented virtuality, these two, where some, some there you're looking at this virtual, mo uh, virtual model while actually being in the real thing physically. And here, you, um, a, real, a real physical thing is going, entering into the virtual space. And in these, the, worlds are, the real physical world is not blocked out, but is combined with virtual elements without necessarily making the virtual elements the, lat the focus of activity. <coughs> Such a vi viewpoint with which I agree, by the way, allows for a rather different set of ways through which an engaging cultural and social presence may be articulated. Here, the user is given space for their own creativity and imagination and participation in their own cultural world and that of the other simultaneously. In this argument, breaking the suspension of disbelief does not necessarily lead to disengagement of the audience. It may have quite the opposite effect by enhancing engagement. In his book, Archaeology and the Senses, Yanis Hamilakis draws attention to some aspects of the expansion of multisensorial experience created for the audiences of cinematic productions that are highly relevant to the discussion of engagement of audiences of virtual archaeology installations. He calls this synesthesia, synesthesia with a C, like cine, reminding us of the power of synesthesia with an S. And in both of these, the visual cues can trigger sensation of other senses. So if you're seeing somebody sweat, it makes you feel hot. Or where visuals can support the illusion of expected sounds, such as wind, thunder, and footsteps. Frank Biocca, who's written a lot about synesthesia, said, notes that an Im in immersive virtual environments, inputs from the visual, auditory, and somatosensory systems contribute to a coherent, spatial mental model. We hypothesize that the richer the mental model of, virtu of the virtual environment, the greater the level of presence. This is certainly the case of players of video games, but is it true of museum and heritage in place or online installations? I actually think not. Let's think for a minute what we audiences are doing while we watch and experience these different forms of immersive environments. In a movie theatre in the West, we sit still with many others in a dark theatre, but nevertheless feel excitement and empathy, sometimes with our hearts racing as we watch the movie. In many other cinema-watching traditions, think Bollywood, the audience are less restricted in their bodily responses and they move around. In watching video games, the excitement is generated by the competitive action, the speed and much upper bodily movement and gesturing. So how are we moving when we... Remember how those people, that audience was moving when they were watching another virtual reality presentation. The only time that I have ever experienced anything close to a multisensorial experience in a virtual environment was in moving through my avatar around our model of Chateauhuyuk, Akapi Island in Second Life. In the examples from Akapi Island in this slide, you can see here my avatar is walking up the virtual path to a virtual model of our Bach shelter while holding a videographic representation of the same path seen physically. And in here, this same event is remediated one step further away from reality in the live stream to a Carpi Island of a real-time lecture about Second Life, about this walk, this video walk, same thing, 
that is being watched by other avatars in the models of Neolithic houses of Chateauhuyuk. The rhythm of movement and its repetition lies at the heart of what is called reality and a sense of place. This means that the rhythm of the contact between human, individual and material or other human, humans, the gestures of storytelling and the daily repetitions of food sharing and seasonal rhythms and annual rhythms are all very important to creating reality and a sense of place. Thus an engaging sense of place, whether as it exists now or as it existed in the past, cannot be captured virtually through a static virtual construction of buildings and sites that are empty of other people and their multi-scalar lives. A virtual 3D in immersive environment is very different from the sensorial experience and sense of place at the physical site of interest itself, where you can feel wind and temperature and moving clouds. From this point of view, again, I would say that augmented reality and other mixed reality formats have a huge advantage over the completely immersive virtual reality projects and, and is an important reason why I think they hold greater promise for future visualizations and interpretive projects. One of the aims of 3D visualization of archaeology is to convey something of the cultural meaning of what is being visualized to the viewer. In 2000, Tim Ingold, apparently inspired by James Gibson's ecological approach to visual perception, made what to me is an inspiring or inspiring statement. And I'll quote a little of it. Information in itself is not knowledge, nor do we become any more knowledgeable through its accumulation. Our knowledgeability consists rather in the capacity to situate such information and understand its meaning within the context of a direct perceptual engagement with our environments. And we develop this capacity by having things shown to us. The idea of showing is an important one. To show something to somebody is to cause it to be seen or otherwise experienced by that other person. It is to lift the veil of some aspect or component of the environment so that it can be apprehended directly. In that way, truths that are inherent in the world are bit by bit revealed or disclosed to the novice. What each generation contributes to the next in this process is an education of attention. Placed in specific situations, novices are instructed to feel this, taste that, or watch out for the other thing. Through this fine tuning of perceptual skills, meanings that are built into the environment are not so much constructed as discovered. Tim Ingold never, has never really applied what he writes to the digital world, but a more careful listening and understanding of the concept of the education of attention. I have come to realize that this statement is very relative to understanding what we might hope to achieve for audiences of virtual archaeology. There are many ideas and examples of how to encourage learning and understanding about other cultures, including long dead ones, through virtual environments. Tim Ingold's model of the education of attention focuses on, the, on knowledge acquisition and cultural reproduction, aligned very clearly with practice-based and apprentice-based social models of education and inactive learning. In Ingold's view, knowledge and information cannot be transmitted separately from its practical enactment. The good teacher or guide, I'm not going to show you this little movie but because you can imagine what it does. The good teacher or guide will provide a scaffold of hints and stories and support to help move the novice along. But for the most part, the novice must watch, copy, improvise and in the end, creatively make the knowledge their own. This is the education of attention. There is no straight line from information to practice, only a crooked one that gradually fills out. It starts with inactive knowledge, which is not just for babies, but rides with, rides with us throughout our lives. He's referring to the idea that in a human's cognitive development, we pass through phases of inactive, then iconic, and then symbolic learning, that he believes the inactive is working throughout your life. So the education of attention, why it's important, is that it demands revisiting a virtual model or world so that cumulative knowledge of the virtual world may be built up gradually. 
thus putting the responsibility of knowledge on the user and that creates an engaging ex environment of exploration. But it is also the responsibility of the creators of such environments or worlds to provide affordances in the equivalent of Ingold's labyrinth with scaffolded hints, surprises, mysteries, hidden elements to which the wanderer or explorer can respond. So what I've suggested to you from the overview of these themes that I believe will motivate and engage audiences can be summarized in this way. One of the greatest assets that is claimed for 3D visualizations in archaeology and cultural heritage, namely that they provide a quick and easy view of what a place was like in the past or what life was like or what the, what's the experience of traveling to the past, this will not make any difference to learning about or engagement with the past or even the visualizations themselves. What will make a difference is slowing down, oh, sorry. What will make a difference is slowing down the process of learning. Shit. Oh, I see. It's got a little mind of its own. Slowing down the process of learning, revisiting numerous times and long term, makes scaffolding the main purpose of guiding rather than prescribed didactic knowledge transfer allow the audience to participate actively in the interpretive process and use their imaginations to fill in purposeful blanks and create meaning, enable social interaction to be involved and make the whole thing story-based and personalized. We might not speak to, seek to emulate the scale of interpretation, I'm sorry, we might seek to emulate the scale of interpretation at which novels and theater and film and TV soap operas that we love to revisit at the scale at which these are created. It's not the, his the scale of history writ large, but the scale of the small intimate group that is the basis of our most engaging stories. The archeological record and heritage places are made from small stories. If only we had the patience to use digital and virtual technologies to harness them. Many researchers and virtual world creators have begun to take up this challenge and Eric Champion is especially in favor of what he calls hermeneutic virtual environments over the more numerous activity-based virtual environments and very common inert explorative, explorative virtual environments. In designing a hermeneutic environment, he says the aim is to engage the visitor in another culture where a participant begins to use and develop the codes of other cultures in order to orient and solve tasks and to communicate the value and significance of those tasks and, and goals to others. I'm not going to, there I had some examples of this Place Hampi, Digital Songlines, and um, the city of Uruk, uh, none of which are perfect, but they are also trying, they're trying to address these challenges. Because I want to go on to something a little different. So in order to do this, I'm just going to do some clicking here. Oh, okay. I personally think that ideally what we are looking for is the format to bring these elements together to engage with virtual archaeology and virtual heritage is not so much computer or video games and worlds, but ways of applying the principles of gamification to a variety of formats for audio visualizing the past. I'm referring more specifically to content gamification, meaning the application of game elements, the story, the challenge, the curiosity, mystery, characters, the learner, the learner becomes part of the story, game mechanics and game thinking to alter the content to make it more game-like. The audience becomes part of the story and they can add to it. We do this actually in our teaching, uh, for example, by employing milestone goals in inquiry-based teaching, but it's not mainstream. You will see how gamification relates to what I have been saying earlier in this presentation when we consider game thinking. So Carl Kapp, an expert on gamification, notes that game thinking or game meta theories make gamification good for engagement and motivation and attention, especially using these elements. Scaffolding, which is the guidance and support for the user to reach to the next level of skill and understanding provided by an avatar or other guide. Self-determination theory, which is a meta theory that itself has three parts. Autonomy, where people are motivated when they feel they have a sense of control and are able to determine 
the outcome of their actions. Learning, where people are motivated and when they feel skilled or at least competent. They get this sense of empowerment, which itself is engaging. And then relatedness, people want to feel connected to other people. Finally, distributed learning is very similar theory to the education of attention, a little bit at a time. Revisit the same problem, but each time with more experience and more knowledge as you proceed in the whatever it is you're doing. This is, <coughs> I, call, I call this a zen of learning. <laughs> so, finally, there are many forms that such gamification can take. There is, of course, a large literature on serious games in history and archaeology, but some of the more interesting forms are those that focus on a rich content that are based in non-linear narratives, they're relatively low-tech modeling, and reachable on the internet through streaming and, or downloading. And some of these go by the names of, you might have heard of them, walking simulators. Anybody gone home? I, interactive digital narratives, like the King of Dragon Pass, I actually looked at that. Um, I know that Rosemary has looked at all of these. Alternate reality games, and my own take on Lev Manovich's database narratives. There are some others too. Mary Flanagan, in her book Critical Play, takes gr uh, gamification into the realm of political and social activism to create or occupy play environments and activities that represent questions about aspects of human life characterized by a careful examination of social, cultural, political, or even personal themes that function as alternates to popular play spaces. This is the same genre of gamification created by Jane McGonigal's work, for example, in her crowdsourced game, Urgent Evoke, to evoke aid to Africa. Another one is the game called Palestine, um, Global, Global Conflicts uh, Palestine, which um, apparently doesn't want to play. Talking about playing, it's actually not that, um, it's, it's defunct anyway, so there's no reason why you should watch it, but you can see it on, on YouTube. Uh, many of these games and these places and these models are defunct, by the way, and that's not something I can go into today, unfortunately. I personally have been drawn especially to an idea of how gamification of archaeology and cultural heritage can provide a way of engaging broader audiences in serious issues such as who owns the past, of the kind that Edward Gonzalez Tennant is pro proposing in his planned walking simulator called Rosewood about an African-American slave compound in Florida. What if certain gamified formats provided not only outlets for visualizing and learning about the past, but a medium for debating contested heritage places, or as virtual environments and simulators to play with alternative interpretations of archaeological content? There are some interesting attempts to do this for history, but almost none yet for archaeology and cultural heritage, but the possibilities seem endless. So Jane McGonigal gave her 2010 TED talk a wonderful title that uh, serves as my last sentence here, which is that gaming can make a better world. Thank you.
affordances and aspects of that, but it seems to me that I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure you have something to say about that. And um, what you would like is more poetics, more. Well, it seems to me that if part of the intentions of creating virtual worlds is to engage people in the same way that films and books do, that there are challenges because the medias of films and books are more integrated into our everyday life, but that at their core they're using concepts for evoking feeling that virtual models don't yet understand, or people can make virtual Yeah, that's a very, it's a very good point that it's exactly um, what well, perhaps I was implying but didn't say explicitly, you know, talking about a lot about the um, the kinds of, of um, more emotional and evocative things that can be can be added to to the whole thing or can be the basis for it in terms of small stories. And I think that the, the, the poetics come through in the small stories. They can be of they should be very emotional, very, very uh, personal, um, and very poetic. But that's, I mean, that whole thing of, of making it more, of providing more, um, what are called affordances of affect. I didn't show you the whole, one of my, I took one of my slides out because it was again too complicated. Not for you guys, you would understand it, but for me to explain it. But one of them is that that part of um, part of what's being suggested by a number of authors is this whole idea of bringing more um, of social affordances and uh, affordances of affect, which would bring in a lot of the emotional stuff. And I absolutely agree. I would make something very poetic if I was <laughs> not that I would write. But of course, if we didn't ask Annie what she means by poetics, but anyway. <laughs> Anyone else? Did you think I focused on the technology? No, but I think the terms, the terminology that gets built around it are yeah. is centered on the production. Like you, right. as you pointed out in your critique, it's all centered on the production, not the experience. Yeah. More. So that absolutely. It's pissy. Thank you. That was wonderful for your presentation. I wonder what you think, given your standpoint here, uh, about tours to sites, because you're alluding that that's more evocative. There's a lot of allusion to actually visiting, whether you're enacting or having questions throughout the site. Whether tours or you know field schools are just the digging, you know, this obsession with digging. People love to dig, right? Here, I guess. Um, where those fit in in this system? Because I understand the virtual recreation aspect that's running throughout, but this education, the, you know, the Ingoldian concept of kind of engagement. Where does that? Re where's the reality come in? I guess in some ways, I I don't know how to see what you're saying that's not sitting in a museum. I mean, mm. are you suggesting that this has got to be on the site? It's got to be in a tour when you go to the site? No, in fact, I'm very uh, um, inspired and admiring of the chess project because it, um, at least part of their project is not, is not museum based. It's based on on an archaeological site. So people are going to the site. So, so they're in the site. Yeah, I don't know if you could tell from the photographs that they're they're in the site there, and they got their iPad. So it's very mobile, and that's what I'm saying with my, what I really am, am pushing towards, as was, as is um, uh, Pujol Tost and um, Stuart Eve and others, um, is for the use of mobile technologies and in creating things where you're not completely immersed in in the uh, in the other world, in the virtual world, so things like augmented reality, I think, has a has a huge future, and that's what um, some of the some of the um, the chess stuff is is based in that, where you can 
you can actually see something with your augmenting your reality with a mobile device while you're in the physical place. So and that's, that's what I was asking about first. It's the physical place. This is very important. I think yeah. yeah, I think that the, the trouble is that not everybody can afford to go to the physical place. So there's always going to be a place. Many times I say place in the same sentence. There's always going to be a place for museum, museum installation. Uh, and especially I think it should be online online things because you can't always go to a museum. You can't, half of the installations I, I can't see because I don't happen to pop over to Sydney, Australia or Thailand or wherever they are, they are showing them. And so I think, I think that the, to, for a proliferation of site-oriented things is what the, the beginning, you're beginning to see in a number of places. Greece is, the, the Greeks are very interested in this, although it's intensely a bit museum oriented, but, but, um, but it's, and Britain, they're doing a lot of it. And hopefully we'll be, we'll be creating some things like that. I, I um, just weirdly following up on this, although it might not seem like it at first, I kept thinking as you were talking about this in triangulation with three other points, um, one of which is the long ago experience in museums where to get kids engaged, they would, you would do scavenger hunts. So it seems to me that that was in fact making the museum into an active site and what we've, we've uh, lost actually is that sort of idea. Yep. Uh, the, the second thing though inevitably was Pokemon Go. Mm -hmm. I was just going, I forgot to bring it up. I had it, I had it in my notes this morning to bring up Pokemon Go. It's, and that's, it's a, a, that's the rewards part. Right. Think, again, one of the things that the scavenger hunt, the museum scavenger hunt as a kid had at the end was right. there was a reward. And a lot of the archaeological things assume that the archaeological knowledge is its own reward. Yes. And I, I feel like that's something we have to get over. Yep. <laughs> 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 really? Um, so, Maybe we're not collecting Pokemonies, but there needs to be something that happens. Right. And then the, the fourth thing, um, the sort of triangulating around your thing, you mentioned Love Manovich's notion of the database's narrative. Right. And you talk about the storytelling, and, and you know, you came very close to even saying the word micro history. And a lot of these I just um, didn't have time to say a lot of these <laughs> these experiential yeah. things, again, are confused about whose story they're telling. Mm -hmm. So there's the stories of the past, and there's the stories of the archaeological discovery, and we, as archaeologists, tend to have those two things as you know, superimposed levels of experience. And I really feel like this is, again, one of our challenges, because right. we can't assume that the non-archaeologist doing these things is actually following us. But when we and I think Pompeii is a really good example of this. When we try and think about, so what's the, the story that isn't the story of our discovery, it's sort of like, a, here's a big solid thud. So we, we need to, I think, triangulate those other yeah. things towards the kind of um, the hunt. So maybe Pokemon Go and the Scavenger Hunt are the same thing. No, so really, that, that would be, I mean, that would be all part of gamification of this kind of thing, which might be, it might be digitally based, yeah. or it might, and that's the really interesting thing about alternate reality games, in which it is a mix of physical and non-physical. It might be very temporary, something very temporary event, right. where you've got like a, a, a hunt for a particular museum, and they, there are examples of doing it in the, um, I think it was in the Smithsonian Library or some one of those libraries where they actually. Um, had a three-day event where you would come in and there would be different books tagged yeah. and then they would cr uh, created all these different stories about those books yeah. that were online. So some of it was physical, some of it was um, putting it online using social media as, as the um, engine. Yeah. And so that's, um, there's a lot to be, a lot to be learned and a lot that we could harness for making things more interesting. I mean, it can start, first of all, in teaching. You know, you have a kind of captive audience. And um, maybe I'll 
<laughs> you have another two questions here. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I'm looking at this thing through the um, ethno-archaeological perspective and thinking about walking around the Swahili side and I'm imagining a group of people from England looking at the Swahili side and uh, giving them some guidance of saying these are uh, shards that look like this and they're standing walls with niches in them and then you try to get them to interact and then they might get to the point of thinking, well, oh, maybe those shards and plates and maybe those plates were niches and what would that mean and from the British standpoint they would say well they were high value they were antiques they were you know and you go mm -hmm. from ethno archaeology I know that they absorbed evil spirits but you can't say well you know you're not right it's not just an antique it actually did something you know and you're like how do you nudge them it sort of feels like telling them from the ethno archaeology that they absorb spirits that made the play break and made them um, you know not susceptible to illness for instance is pretty darn interesting compared to well I don't know they're probably antiques that they really value. So are you thinking of this for like a Swahili virtual world? That that's actually very similar to one of the games also defunct because, uh, but um, was in existence in Australia, which was um, ones I didn't, I didn't show it. Um, which was they they made this whole 3D model of a game, and but this, of, um, its point was to get people to understand Aboriginal rituals and symbols and language and in relation to things. So they had models of the things that you could turn around. And then you would go, the people would talk to you and talk to you about what they thought it was. And then um, they didn't actually have what the archaeologists would have said or what other people, it was only one, one person's viewpoint and it was an elder of the, of the Aboriginal tribe. Um, that had real problems, that, that game went, got into real problems about um, having some things that they shouldn't have had. On you know telling some telling some details of rituals that they shouldn't have done on this public public game site. But it's still up. Where it's is the interaction. So the person's coming in and wanting them to interact, and then they go off in a way that you happen to know. Well, do you just say that's engaging them and they're learning? No, which they're was learning. Where, where, where they was say that the British person looks at this thing and gets to the point where the plates were the shards were plates and they learn the niches and the British person. Says, or George says, you know, those were antique objects of great value. I mean, they're satisfied with that, and they walk away. Yeah. So then, how do you wrong. say that that's wrong? Well, that would be up to the designer. I'm not going to say how you should do that. You, the designer, would decide. What, how would you? How would you? But I think that's pretty confusing. Yeah, definitely. Because, because, because if you guess wrong, you don't get the point. Oh, I see. So yeah, you could. Yeah, that's right. Guessing. Yeah. So you keep guessing until they get to your thing that you happen to or know. Or at least right. within the domain, there's two or three or four. Right. It's better so you guys are all game designers. I can tell you. All you're going to do is, is apply well, we yourself. We have for Sadipa already. We're working on that. Great. Right. See? Yeah. It's not insoluble if you can think about it as really interactive, not just one exchange. I think a lot of these things are thought of as one exchange. Oh, I see. So it also, it also depends on the content that you feed the system like anything else. Right. And if you yeah. give possibilities of also playing with the content of alternatives, like this, the interpretations, like we work with interpretations. So this can be interpreted as this, but can be also this or that. And the combination of all these elements in the interaction with the game would give you a higher score or a more interesting narrative and what not. Or another way to do it that isn't a score is you make your guess and then you, get, then you get a narrative. Exactly. And the narrative would be more than a right. score, but actually, yeah. 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 I mean, I'm a game player, so I think of yeah. scores. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 By but the way, I wanted to say that maybe last like, sorry, oh, go ahead. I didn't have a Okay. Maybe after the day of uh, the open day for the Okapi Island, it was the day that I was going out with my boobs up. <laughs> it was new to me. A virtual your life. Your avatar. Yeah. It was yeah. totally new to me. It was totally new to me. I was there. 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 I was just completely naked. And I said, uh, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, God. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry.
have to solve their rewards, and you get things wrong, you don't get the reward. And, and it's minimal text, and it's very immersive, I think. That's so it, a, yeah, that's there's a, two versions of it, and they're completely... I'd love to have a look at that. That's yeah, like the one that they're asking. Yeah, yeah. 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 that one um, with the... With the uh, what I mentioned it, it's a walking simulator. Um, whereas...
take it out of the Pokemon let lingo and into the Amashi camp lingo and the content changes. Um, but we had, you know, former internees who were working with us who are like 85 years old and downloaded the game onto their phones too. <laughs> you know, so I think it depends on the site and the community you're working with mm -hmm. and the kind of information. But. So did we have one more question or shall we um, thank for it for what we have got? Obviously it's going to stimulate everybody. <laughs> we, 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 must make, we must make a design group. <laughs> and people who have any actual skills in this. Um, I, 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 I can tell stories. I can tell stories. There you go. 